This is a test. One, two, three. This is a cat. One, two, three. This is my new cat. One, two, three. His name is Os Oscar. 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 Hello, Oscar. Hello, everyone, and welcome to part two of I Studied Game Art So You Don't Have To. But, in fact, you do have to. <laughs> so, today we're going to be talking about 3D, and it's going to be a long one, I'm afraid. Um, so if you watched my last video, I talked a lot about, yeah, I talked about 2D. Uh, I talked a lot about other things that I've learned about working in a group, feedback, stuff like that. So if you've missed out on that video, I highly recommend you go and watch that too. Because uh, both 2D and 3D was part of studying game art. So I think it's a good thing to have both. And as I said in my previous video, I'm not here to deter anyone from going to school. I think school is great. Uh, these videos are more for people who maybe can't go to school, but still want to know what they're teaching. So maybe they can learn on their own. As I said, you're not getting away from studying. I'm sorry. So getting into it. And I'm going to take you through a 3D pipeline from, I guess, idea, or we're not having, we're not doing anything special, I guess, but from zero to finished model. Uh, so you understand a little bit of how that works. And to understand the 3D pipeline, first you need to understand the what I would like to call anatomy of a 3D model. So I'm going to go through that now. The software that we're going to be using today is Blender. And Blender is great because it's free. Uh, so if you're a beginner, it's a really good thing to just yeah, get Blender, try it out, see if you like it. Um, when I started studying 3D, I didn't even know if I would like it because i would never done 3D before, and it turns out that I like it quite a lot. So we're using Blender, it's a great software. Um, Blender isn't really industry standard. Um, I feel like it's getting more and more recognition, and it's getting more and more acceptable to use it within uh, gaming or VFX and stuff, but it's not quite there yet, even though it's it's a great software. So the programs that are industry standard for 3D modeling and such are Maya, 3D Studio Max, Cinema 4D. Um, yeah, there's a lot more probably, but that, those are the big names. Uh, but today we're using Blender. And when you open Blender, this is the, the first thing you see. You'll see a camera, a little light, and a cube. And what you usually do when you open a new scene is you go Bye bye. <laughs> and then if you want, you just add a new one. It's just the rules of Blender, can't change them. You gotta get rid of that first cube. Can't use it. <laughs> so now we're in the program and the, the window that you see here, it's our viewport. So this is where you can see everything. Um, this thing right here is the hierarchy. Uh, if you had multiple objects, like let's add a cylinder. Um, so then you can see both of them in there, right? Uh, but we're gonna not do that for now. Here are a bunch of stuff. We're not gonna get into all this stuff today. Uh, the point of these videos, as I said, is to go over it very shallow. Um, so everyone who, anyone who can't go to school can just get a little bit of the basics and then study it for themselves. Yeah, all of this stuff. Have fun. <laughs> When it comes to the anatomy of a 3D model, there's a lot of stuff to say about it. Um, for me, I'm gonna imagine myself as like before I knew anything about 3D. Uh, this is a cube, right? But it's not a volume. So when you're looking at a 3D model, there's no volume to it. Uh, so like if I would enter here and go in here and delete that, there's nothing inside. <laughs> You would think there's like just like a square, solid square, but there, it's not. All 3D models are just, we call it a mesh or a wireframe. So it's just the outside of it. On the inside, nothing. <laughs> it's an illusion. You, you've probably seen it if you've moved your camera around in a game and accidentally gone into a character and you see it looks creepy on the inside. <laughs> there are actually volumes uh, that can be used for making games. They're called voxels. But we're not going to get into that because I don't know enough about it. But you can take a look uh, at that if you're interested. 
So let's get down to business and have a look at what is a wireframe or a mesh? What is this model made up of? If you look at the corners here, you see little dots. These are called vertices or um, ver vertexes. Vertexes? Oh, it's a one vertex anyway, or a one vertice. Um, and they are connected by edges. I hope you can see this. They are connected by edges. So all edges end in a vertice. And when the edges connect up like this, the inside area of that is called a face. So this is a face, this is a face. And that's pretty much what we call a polygon, I guess. So I'm gonna go ahead and just slice this like that. These are still faces. This is a face, this is a face. But these are obviously triangles. And this is a, not a triangle, <laughs> it's a, something we call a quad. This is a tri, this is a quad. When you're playing your game, all the models are made up of triangles in the game engine. So however you work with your models, in the end they're turning out like triangles, if, if we're talking games here. Um, but when we're working with 3D, we actually avoid triangles. And there's a good reason for that. There's actually plenty of good reasons for that. For once, it's much easier to work with quads. Um, and triangles can create problems with the mesh. Because, uh, I mean, there's a lot of more steps coming after this. Uh, triangles can create artifacts. I mean, quads can create artifacts too, I guess. It really depends on how you model. But uh, triangles can be a little bit of a problem. And if you're planning on animating, your model, character, whatever it is. Uh, triangles are usually not a good idea either. Um, you can look into this on your own. Uh, but they're not a big no-no. It's okay to have triangles on your model, especially if your model is just a static object. But uh, generally we avoid using them and just work with quads. So now what would happen if I did this? What's happening here? What's going on? So now, this is a triangle, right? What's that? Now you have one, two, three, four, five. Now there's one here as well. So now we have five edges. What the hell? What's happening? This is a no-no. <laughs> this, is, this is a no-no. Um, so when you put your model into the game engine, it triangulates it, right? Like I said before. Um, I don't actually know the exact reason for it, but it does. Uh, so if you have quads, they just need to slice them. Then you get two triangles. But if you have uh, one like this, that is called uh, an N-gon, um, the game engine's not quite sure sometimes what to do with it. Sometimes it works, I guess, but this is a no. This is sin <laughs> in, in game art. So if you have this, then you need to fix it. So either you just get rid of that, or um, I would slice it like this, I guess. Then you have triangles, but you know. Don't have polygons that have more than four corners or four vertices. So what we are doing here is called hard surface modeling or just pure box modeling. This is very good if you're creating, I don't know, well, hard surfaces. <laughs> Uh, furniture, weapons, buildings, uh, I guess anything really. With it comes a bunch of different things that you could do. I'm not going to name all of them, but here's a few. Extruding, beveling, bridging, subdividing, merging, and a lot more. Another big part of a uh, wireframe's anatomy that we're going to go through now is normals and normals <laughs> I'm, I'm already scared normals is sort of just a concept it's like it's it's like math <laughs> and i don't i i can't say that i 100 percent understand it myself i understand what i need to do to work with them but i don't exactly understand how they work and, but they are very important to know about when you're doing 3d modeling so if we have our model here and we have a look at our normal. So this is the 
the face normals. So you have face normals, I think you have vertex normals and split normals. I'm not sure, you can look that up. Um, and how to explain this? Okay, so the normals help out with how your model sort of is visualized. So they can, they sort of can tell you if it's the right, uh, if the polygon is <laughs> backwards <laughs> or stuff like that. Um, telling the engine how to render the surface of the polygon. It's a whole complicated business. There's a whole science, so you can go and look that up because <laughs> I'm not going to be very good at explaining this. Um, but it's good to know that they exist because sometimes you're working on a model and the texture stuff is not working and you don't understand what's happening and it just turns out that your, uh, your normals are inside out or they're just not working or something like that and then you need to go fix them, which isn't like that hard, but uh, the whole, as I said, the whole concept of normals is quite complicated, so I think I might just leave it at that. But there are, of course, other things you can do, except from pushing and pulling polygons around in that way. Well, I guess, actually, this, this is the same thing, but it feels different. So, you could actually do sculpting, and it's technically the same thing as what we just did. It just feels a lot more, you know, like sculpting. So here's a face or a head that I did when I was still in school and I'm in the sculpting mode now in Blender and here you see a bunch bunch of tools and you can use them to literally sculpt sculpt and they do all kinds of different things so you can get you can you could you know create your masterpiece look at that <laughs> um so how are we able to do this so you see it's very smooth right like it's very smooth and you can make these smooth bumps and lumps and you can pretty much treat it like clay. Why is that? How can I do that? So if we go back into this mode and we go and check out the wireframe, this is what happens. Yeah. You see that? You can barely... <laughs> this <laughs> is the wireframe. So for you to be able to sculpt like that, you need to have it, what we call high poly, very high, very, very high. The more detail, the more polygons, because you need it to be smooth, right? So there's uh, specific programs for this. You could uh, sculpt in Blender, nothing wrong with that. But the industry standard one is called ZBrush. It's really fun, really cool, really cool program really recommend having a look at that. It does cost money though, so it's not for free. So this is what you get. And this is not gonna work in a game. <laughs> or actually, as we've seen in some games, it does somehow work. I don't understand how they get it to work, but they do. But for me as a prior 3D art student, when I'm looking at models like that, I go, no, don't, don't, don't do it. <laughs> Because the more polygons your models have, the more the engine is going to have to work to try to understand things. So in games, what we try to do is to have as little polygons as we can. And there's a difference here in between, let's say, the VFX industry and the game industry. For In VFX, there's a lot more usually realistic looking stuff and you can get away with having a lot more polygons um, because you're just shooting like a scene, you're rendering some sort of effect, uh, so you can get away with that. But in games, when you're playing in sort of, you know, real time, things get a bit complicated if you have a lot of polygons and the the game needs to compute all of that at the same time. Whew. So that's why we try to have as little polys as possible, but still enough to make it look good. So now we made a face and it looks like this. What do we do? So what we need to do is called retopologizing or retopo. I just say retopo. Um, in, it's pretty much, you, I'm also not going to go through all of that right here. Uh, I'm probably going to find a nice looking video to show you sort of what it looks like. Uh, there's some add-ons for Blender. You can do it in Maya has its own tool. That's really good. Um, so basically, when you're retopologizing your sculpt, 
um, is that you lay out new polygons all over because now you got a nice shape, right? Um, you just need to <laughs> have less polygons. So you pretty much lay out a new mesh around your old one with less polygons. And it can look a little bit like this because I have the, the low poly. So we have the high poly and now we have the low poly. And as you can see, they're quite similar, right? So this is the high one and this is the low one. <laughs> so if we get rid of the high one and now we take a look at this wireframe. Would you look at that? You can actually see the polygons. <laughs> so now this is way lower. Actually, if I click here, we can actually see the statistics. So this one is 18,797 triangles. And let's go to this one. Yeah. <laughs> Have a look at that. <laughs> Enough said. And there's a bunch of tools and, and instructions for how to retopo your, your models properly, especially when it comes to faces and hands and stuff that moves a lot. Um, a really good topology is essential for it to look good and not. Because a, a mesh can break if you model it in like a nasty way, I guess. If you model it crazy, um, it can break and it doesn't look good. So you want a clean, as clean as possible, as easy to work with as possible. So that's how retopology works. A lot of people don't like it. I guess it takes time, especially if you have a really detailed sculpt. It could take a really long time, but it's really worth it. And it's sort of therapeutic as well. So what now? Do you have a model? It looks great. But it looks kind of boring. You want some color on there, right? You want it to look a little bit more fun. Should you start painting it? No. <laughs> That's too much fun. Now we need to do something called UV mapping. And what that is, is that we talked about this before, right? It's a mesh. It's n There's nothing inside. It's literally a shell. So what you need to do, think of it as a candy wrapper. Now you need to take that mesh and cut it in such a way that you can fold it out like a candy wrapper. And it looks kind of crazy, so let me show you. So this is our mesh, and if I do this, this is my UV map. So this is what it looks like, and it looks kind of crazy. This is yet another one that's kind of hard to explain, but I'm gonna try my very best. So what we've done is that we've decided which edges to cut uh, in order for the mesh to lay out as flat as possible. Because if you don't do that, um, it's literally like a real, like a football. So if you cut a football, maybe you just cut a little thing and you try to, you know, make it flat. It's gonna have a lot of distortion. So if I wouldn't cut this as precisely as I could, then the texture later would look really weird. So you want it as flat as possible. That's that's the deal. This can take a while if you have a model with a bunch of parts, but again, it's worth it. It makes the textures look really nice. Again, go in and do the research. There's a lot more to be said about this. I'm not very good with the technical stuff. I just know what I need to do to get the thing done. <laughs> There's some built-in stuff that you can use to know if you have stretching or not. If we go in here and look up UV stretch, you can press this and then you can see um, the amount of problems you have, I guess. <laughs> and then you can see how much stretching you have. So red means no good. And it's basically from red to blue. So blue is, this works, this, this is good. And red is eh, probably want to cut this in a different way. So looks like I've done like a, a decent job here, actually. <laughs> Maybe it's a bit too many parts. I'm not sure. It's been a while since I made this, uh, but it's pretty blue. So it looks all right. Look at that face. It's so creepy. <laughs> so when your UV map is looking very blue and nice, that means you've done a good job and it's good to go to go to texture. 
And here we are in a program called Adobe Substance Painter. Um, here's where you create your textures. Um, this is a really good program. It's pretty much industry, industry standard, I would say. There's also another one that people talk about that's called 3D Coat. I haven't used it myself. There's probably a bunch more programs, but this is the one that I've learned. And we got our little model in here. And here's the UV map. So as you can see, the, the, the program understands, right, that what goes where. So you can paint either on here or you can paint directly on her. And how the old school veterans used to work, because they didn't have a vis visualization program like this back in the day, they would just paint their textures directly on this like flat surface and just hope that it looks good on <laughs> the model. Well, I, it's skill for sure. I, I have lots of respect for them. That's That takes some skill to do that. We have easy nowadays with this program. <laughs> But anyways, so either you can go ahead, like Substance is really cool, you have a bunch of cool textures here, you could just drop straight onto it. Look, now we have like a stylized wooden lady. Um, yeah, you could just do that, you can paint, you can overlay, you can do a bunch of stuff. I'm not gonna go into how this program works, because there's a lot. Um, but yeah, this is where you create your textures. And you could also do something called baking. <laughs> so if you had a high poly that had a lot more detail that you have right now, you can take that high poly and this low poly in here and bake them together. So that's what happens then pretty much is that the details of the high poly gets transferred as a texture onto your low poly. So the, the model doesn't change. It just gets a little bit of the detail that it lost uh, in the texture. Because as I said, let's not forget, this is not a real thing existing, right? So we can tell it what to look like. Because the light is not light. Really, it's fake light. So we can say, I, in this space, I want the light to bounce in a different way. And that's how you get... Like, for example, maybe that. Yeah, this is perfect, actually, for showing this. So now, it looks like... Like, what the hell will happen? <laughs> it was all flat, and now you have all these detail. But this is an illusion. We're just telling the light how to bounce. Or the program is telling it how to bounce. So there's nothing different with my model. It's still flat. You see? It's still... There's still no, no difference here. It just looks like it. <laughs> Sneaky. And here you have it. This is my finished textured version of my face. As you can see, there's a lot of cool stuff you could do. Her eyes are glossy, her piercings are metallic. Um, I've hand painted her face. Everyone who uses makeup, you can tell I've done highlights and, and stuff on her. <laughs> Just to make it look a little bit nicer. Also freckles. Uh, so that's it. And you can see also on the UV map now that everything has its color. Look, <laughs> the nose. So now when you're done with your texturing, you just need to export all of your texture maps. Yes, now we're getting into texture maps. Let me show you what they are. Here they are, the beautiful little maps. So now it's going to get complicated again. <laughs> you get a texture map for different things in the texture. So this is your base colored map. Uh, it's also called an albedo map. So this is just color, pure color. As you can see, <laughs> uh, you can get uh, metallic, so it's telling black or white, right? Yes or no, or no or yes, whatever. <laughs> so this map is just telling, is it metallic or not metallic? Uh, we got, what do we got? A AO, ambient occlusion, is there shadows? It's pretty much shadows, I would say. Uh, where does the shadows go? Um, roughness, so this is, is it shiny? Or is it just rough? And then the more complicated ones are the height map and the normal map. So the, let's go into the normal map. We talked about normals, right? So the normal map affects the normals, I guess. It's gonna affect how light bounces on the surface of my polygons. Uh, so as you can see, see here in the hair, there's some lines. So that's what that does. So you can create sort of like fake details 
Actually, can I just do it right here? Because it, maybe it's easier. So if I go... And then you can... I, I don't even know how to explain this. This is so hard. <laughs> Why? Why is it? Why? Why is... So this is... This is how we fake detail. So we use the normal map and height to fake detail. So I can either extrude or intrude. <laughs> Make an indentation. Look, it looks like I'm creating an indentation in the skin, but it's it's not... The model has not changed. The model is the same. And if we go the other way around, I go up. It looks like it goes up. But this is fake, because if we now look at this at an angle, it's all flat. It's just an illusion of how the light bounces on the polygons. Don't quote me on that. Go go look at the science. <laughs> go look at the technical stuff. <laughs> So yeah, we got the normal map, and then we got the height map. The height map... Kivo. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna talk about that, I think. So now when you have all of these texture maps, you can plug them into either Blender, or you can plug them into your game engine and make materials, put it on your model. Now it's looking super nice. Now it's finished. Pretty much finished. Unless you want to do animation and stuff. And now we're back in Blender. And here's a scene with the face that I just made. Just made? I made like... What, two years ago or something? It's here that you would then rig your character, prepare it for animation and stuff like that. It's a whole process, like everything is with 3D, really. So when you're rigging a character, we use bones. You can see some of the bones here. Unfortunately, the, she doesn't have any arms or legs, so I can't show you that. So if we go into post mode, I can actually show you a little bit about how it works. So this is her jawbone. And it's rigged in such a way that um, I, can, and I can pick and choose what each bone does and what part of my model is connected to which bone, so to say. So, first you create your skeleton, or your armature, and then we do something called weight painting. <laughs> There's a lot to learn. Um, and weight painting is pretty much you painting the um, model to tell it how much it should be affected by each bone, or if it even should be affected by a bone. So in this case, I probably weight painted the jaw, to move when the jawbone moves. So let's see. Yep. We got some movement. And actually you can see this is moving a little bit, so I've made a mistake. So this has been painted in such a way that it says, oh move when I move this bone. But obviously it shouldn't. It is my student work after all. <laughs> so here is a better vis visualization of what Wayne painting looks like. So you can see I've selected this jawbone and we're in weight paint mode right now. As you can see, there's a bunch of different modes. Um, so we're in weight paint mode. So what I've done here is that I've, I've painted these colors. So red means affect a lot and blue means nothing. Uh, so I've said when this moves, then move the jaw. Uh, like that. So the, the more we go in, the bluer it gets, because obviously I don't want this to be moving when I'm moving the jawbone. So that is how weight painting works uh, in a very, a very easy explanation, <laughs> very simple explanation. And when it comes to your armature and the bones, there's a lot of stuff uh, to be said about that. Um, a lot of it has to do with the hierarchy. We talk a lot about parenting, like a parent and child sort of relationship in between uh, things in your viewport. Like, if this bone moves, then this bone should also move. But if this bone moves, this should stay still. Like, there's a bunch of stuff like that that uh, is good to know about. So I'd recommend looking into a lot of tutorials for rigging and understanding the, the I guess, interactions in between bones and... There's stuff, other stuff, like there's IK and FK rigs, <laughs> so it helps you have more natural movement with arms and legs and stuff. That's also something you could look into. There's a lot, like rigging is a whole 
job. Like, there's people that do rigging for a living. There's some crazy rigs. Actually, I want to show you this rig that's crazy. So yeah, you could either have a really complicated rig like that or something simple. Like, this rig is actually more complicated than it needs to be now that I know more about rigging. But it's, it's quite simple. Uh, you got a jaw, got some bones in the hair to make it move. Um, and then you just animate. And I'm not gonna go through that really, but it's, it's keyframes and all this stuff that you do when you do frame by frame animation or any type of animation. So here we can see what it looks like in this view. Man, this is so long ago. <laughs> it would be really nice to redo this now. And then you can export the model with its animations into your game engine. But if we take a look at the scene again, obviously there's a lot more going on here than a model and a little bit of textures. Because I've built sort of like a studio <laughs> here. Uh, we got cameras, we got light. There's some lights in here. You can see she has a red and a yellow light on her. Um, yeah, there, it's pretty much just a virtual studio where you can do whatever you want. Let me grab this. We can just grab this and play around with it. And you see how it affects the, the model. It's pretty fun. It's pretty cool. And that's like the cool thing about doing 3D. I mean, I guess 2D too, but it's separate. Um, is that you can create whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. And it's it's really cool. And sometimes I f even I forget that I can do whatever I want. And except for creating models like this and doing rigging and animation there's a bunch of other stuff you could do in 3d as well and that's like um, simulations and vfx and stuff so um, there's liquid simulations fabric simulations smoke simulations uh, you could do particle systems that there's a lot of stuff to be done and to be to play around with in 3d um, I've played around with fabric simulations there's a program called Marvelous Designer, which lets you design clothes, and it's really fun. Like, it's a super fun uh, program, and the, f the fabric um, simulates really well, and oh, it's so much fun to work in. Um, if you want to do fashion stuff, you can do that. I've done liquid simulations in uh, Blender. It was a lot of fun, too. I didn't really master it. <laughs> I think it's a hard thing to master. Uh, my level of simulation skills pretty low, but I had a lo lot of fun playing around with it. And talking about all of this stuff, <clears throat> uh, a program that's really popular when it comes to stuff like this is called Houdini. Um, there you can do a ton of simulation stuff. Like, you could actually model in that program as well, but it's very technical. It doesn't have, it does have a viewport like this, but you don't push and pull polygons in the same sort of way, I would say. It's a node-based program, so it's... I'm not gonna go into it. I've played around with it, it's fun. We learned it in school. Not to a high degree, but um, if you're more into technical stuff, I'd uh, encourage you to look at Houdini. Um, you can do crowd simulations and stuff, making them... I don't know, I can't even... It's, it's really cool. It's really cool, and it's it's uh, Houdini is very much used in VFX work. Um, not as much in gaming, but maybe a little bit. Oh, also, I forgot to mention um, when we export our models and stuff like that, uh, especially in gaming. Usually, the the standard that we use is that we use FBX files or OBJ. I usually just use FBX files. Um, I might do an OBJ if I need it for some... They're a little bit different. Um, look into it. <laughs> and if you made an animation in Blender or like just like a still that you really like, then you can render out an image or a video. Uh, there's different render engines that makes things look different and they... They're... How can I say? I'm using Eevee right now and it takes a lot less uh, of my computer's power <laughs> to use it. Or you could use stuff like cycles uh, and you can see how different it looks and you can see that the viewport is having a lot more trouble uh, making it work. So for example if we go back to Eevee and I look at that it looks more plasticky already and that works. It depends on what look you want. So if I play this it goes 
it goes pretty smoothly, right? Uh, but if I go back to cycles and I play that, that's what happens. I'm working on a laptop, so <laughs> it doesn't have as much power to load stuff. Um, so yeah, there's different types of render engines built into Blender. I'm not, I don't remember which one is in Maya, I'm sorry. Um, but there's also external render engines like uh, V-Ray and Marmoset and different stuff like that. Uh, I guess they have their different uh, pros and cons. I've all only used Maya and Blender's own when I've rendered stuff, so I'm not a master in that, so you have to do your own research <laughs> what you like the most. And there's a whole science behind rendering stuff as well. Uh, you have like how, ma how many samples you have and and look at all these different <laughs> things you can play around with. There's a lot. Um, and it's all gonna affect the render time because it takes it can take a while to render even a single image depending on what definition, like what resolution you want. Usually I remember when I was doing bigger school projects then I would let my computer just render overnight because like a single render could take six hours eight hours more like rendering times for 3d are quite high then getting your model into your game engine is also a whole thing in itself uh, that I'm probably might not go into in this video because it's gonna be long enough um, but there's some things to think about there as well And I know this video has been a lot and I'm really sorry if I haven't been able to explain the technical stuff very well. Um, I think I'm I'm quite a technical... I've become more technical since I started doing 3D, but I'm still not like extremely good at it. Like I know enough to do this, but I don't really understand it, all of it on a more deeper level. If that's something that you guys enjoy, totally go and do the research. Uh, it, it is quite interesting how it all works together to create awesome games. Cool VFX and films and just tiny school projects like this one. Uh, but anyways, I hope you've had fun learning a little bit more about how 3D works. And uh, I hope uh, maybe I've ignited a little spark in you to want to learn more or maybe I totally scared you away because this is a lot and I, I I understand that especially they like normals and UV mapping and ray topologizing and stuff like that um it is scary stuff but when you've when you've gotten it it's just it's just all fun it's just all fun it's very meditative to work with 3d because there's a lot of stuff to do before you're finished uh but I hope that you will take something from this and have fun with 3D. There's probably a lot of stuff that I've missed, uh, but I'm sure you can find it while you're doing your studies. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoy what I do, you can find me on Ko-fi and support me on there. Uh, if you want more updates from me, uh, you can find me on social media. All links are down below. Thank you so much again. I hope you will have a good one. Bye bye.